truthfully, it'd be pretty cool if like everything you wanted to eat, you had to go fucking kill first. I like it. <laughs> I you know, be or not much. eat it. <laughs> 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 about to eat some fresh wahoo right be, now i'm eating a lot of vegetables i don't got a very green thumb i need to rely on a woman for that but i'd even eat a ton of protein myself but yeah the, the vegetables would probably elude me and how did it start out like what was the origin of the story too much alcohol really <laughs> okay because if god wanted us to have fiberglass boats he would have given us fiberglass trees it's it's for fishermen it's not for taking the wife and the wife's friends it's I think that it's a really, really pretty bit. And then there was a blur that went by and ended up in the cockpit as yeah. far as if I can remember uh-huh. correctly. <laughs> Welcome back, State of Sport Fishing Podcast. I'm Nick Carullo. I'm joined with me, my co-host, Anthony Pino with Hooked Optics from Captain of the Blood Money. Today, our guest is Captain Dom from Rhode Island in Massachusetts with Coastal Charter Sport Fishing. He does light tackle, uh, bluefin tuna. How you doing, man? I'm, I'm well. How about yourselves? We're doing great, man. Thanks for joining us. Nice. Thanks for having me. So, Dom, uh, tell the uh, listeners a uh, little intro about yourself and how you kind of got into it. Um, well, the love for fishing started way, way back. But um, how I got into it was, uh, was from a military family, moved around a lot and ended up in Rhode Island uh, when my dad got stationed um, down there, Quonset Point. Um, and... I was fortunate enough to have a shoreline uh, in Narragansett Bay that allowed access, you know, whenever a kid wanted to, to, to shore cast. And, and so it started there, the local ponds. Um, I worked commercially to start actually um, out of my own boat, a 20 footer. I was fortunate enough in one of the lotteries um, to get a, a lobster license. So I had a hundred pots and uh, I was working those and working the fin fish permit and doing a little work in the kitchens and dabbling in a little bit of party in it. College, <clears throat> college didn't work for me. So uh, decided to dedicate my time to the water and um, worked on the back of a few boats in the private industry and then um, jumped in into the party boat world uh, at the same time that I got my captain's license. So I, I was doing small boat, you know, two-man charters on a little 21-foot bay boat in Narragansett Bay, starting with squid in the spring, doing striped bass, flounder, stuff like that. Um, a couple years into it, uh, I got the bug on the offshore, uh, the local bait shop there in Middletown, Rhode Island, um, the gentleman that uh, owned it is, you know, an offshore aficionado, one, probably one of the best fishermen on the planet. Uh, a real quiet guy, does his own thing, takes some few select people out. And I was fortunate enough for him to, uh, to take me out on, on quite a few trips. And these were just him and I. Uh, he didn't take a bunch of people and, and, and we were headed out in a, a 31 foot black watch. An express with twin Cummins diesels, uh, fishing for yellowfin and big eye and swordfish. Um, you know, mahi mahi, whatever you could put in the cooler there on, on a basically a commercial basis um, out of a smaller boat. And, and I, I learned an awful lot about big fish and deep water from him. And through the course of trying to become a, a charter captain and find my way, the bottom fishery um, was, was real prevalent in my area. It, it's something that's age old, you know, from the party boats all the way down to the down east with the six packs. Guys show up to do the the, the cooler filling fisheries, basically, um, you know, the, the, the day equates to dropping anchor and, and fishing for bottom fish, whatever you can fill your cooler with cod, um, there's a popular one, haddock, things like that. So I, I, I did the multi-species thing to start. Um, and it was only a few years into that, that I not only saw the writing on the wall with the, you know, the fisheries and, and how things were sort of morphing from, uh, a, a, you know, 1960s to 1980s mentality where, it was all about the harvest and, uh, you know, the sport fisheries were, were, were booning. Um, you know, there was an awful lot of people going to exotic locales for, for, for many a year for Marlin and, and, and the bluefin tuna down off the Bahamas. I mean, there's a, there's a history that goes way, way back on, on, on large game fish in salt water. And so New England was a, a perfect place to end up. And the bluefin just made sense. Um, as, a, as a guy who was trying to build a charter business, I saw this sort of niche. Um, I, I was able to approach it right about the same time that a really amazing year class of bluefin tuna came along. Um, they showed up in my Rhode Island waters in 2000, 2001, and 2002, real close to shore. 
and I was able to target him out of a little 21 foot boat with a 130 Yamaha V4 on the back. Um, little center console, no T-top, no radar. Um, you know, and this was back mid nineties to, to late nineties. And this was after sort of the crash on the big fish. Um, I, I had some experience with the larger fish um, just from being from the area and also having a, a ton of neighbors and, and, and family members that, that, you know, not only went on sport fishing trips, Block Island used to be the bluefin capital of the world. Um, you had Nebraska Shoals, you had the mud hole off Rhode Island, but you also had Cape Cod Bay, where of course the hand lining was going on and Stellwagen Bank all the way up through the storied grounds, you know, north to Maine. Those Mainers keep their mouths shut up there, but um, you know, that Cape Cod fishery has, has sort of just been the epicenter of, of, of the comeback of this bluefin. And, and there was a, you know, a long period there from 1996 all the way through about five or six years ago, we had real trouble landing our commercial quota or our quota dwindled because if you don't catch it under ICAT rules, you sort of give it away to other countries. Um, and that species over the last say 10 to 15 years has, has made a real strong comeback. Um, and I was fortunate enough to see that first year class and that was 2002 or 2003. Um, and that's when I made the jump. I, I decided uh, 2004, they showed up uh, inshore and they left my waters and I had to follow them to the east. I ended up trailering into Massachusetts waters and having to go online. Um, you know, thankfully Massachusetts has this super cool title 20 or title 18. I don't know the exact title that it is, but allows access for out of state, you know, people to come in. So I got the out of state charter boat permit and I followed them all the way as far as I could reasonably uh, in, a, in, a, in a truck and a trailer and get home in the afternoon, um, you know, upwards of an hour, hour and a half, one way, launching in the morning, bright and early and then coming back. Um, and then in 2006, 2005 and 2006, these little small bluefin, the footballs as they call them, we had this huge batch, which was that 2003 year class, show up as, um, you know, 35 to 40 inch fish. And they were just, it was polluted with them um, everywhere, all over. And they blew through Rhode Island real quick in 2005. So it only took me about a half a second to grab my boat and start heading and so from where I was located, it was only about a 45 to 50 minute drive to Cape Cod Bay, where I'd been launching before out on the arm, you know, that geographic spot out near Chatham there and, and, and the lower elbow. It's, it's, it's a good distance. It's an hour and a half or so. Whereas launching out of Cape Cod Bay gave me that ability to get there reasonably quickly um, and not only do one trip, but you're able to do two trips. And some guys were doing three trips uh, out of that lower bay all through 2004, five, six, seven. And then in 2008, everything changed. That so changed. sort of the history. And were, were you, uh, when you were doing the small fish, you weren't, were you killing those fish or just for sport fishing? Like, really? Oh, absolutely. No, uh, most of the clients would take one, you know, um, there's different regulations each year, but some years it's, three fish under 47 inches and greater than 27 inches. And you can take yeah. one out of that next slot, which is 47 to 73 inches and, you know, less than, and then everything from 73 inches and over is a, um, you know, a, a large medium or a giant, which is a commercial class. Or if the trophy is open early in the year, you can harvest one of those under the recreational permit. Um, the bluefin fishery is, is pretty complicated. It's got a long history about how it came about. Um, the different categories, the, the hand categories, you have the harpoon. Um, you had at one time, which was just the same category, which actually gave us all our category now in the hand gear without those same boats early on, we actually wouldn't have had a fishery at all. And so it morphed from a, a large seine fishery um, using the seine boats and the weirs down in lower Cape Cod Bay. Um, this is going back as far as like the 20s, you know, through the 40s, there were weirs down in Cape Cod Bay, fish weirs, you know, land-based, um, where they would harvest bluefin tuna. And then the same boats, the white dove um, being the most famous and prolific. Um, and then throughout the course of the bluefin's history as a, as a targeted species, before they became commercially sought after, they were sort of a nuisance to the Canadian fishermen. They called them horse mackerel up in the herring nets. You know, you had a few rich guys, Zane Gray and, and, and Ernest Hemingway, and you had Cat K, and you had a few sport fishing clubs, um, you know, that were after those fish. But once they became commercially 
you know, viable. They became truthfully probably one of the most pursued animal on, on the planet in terms of their numbers and, and the actual harvest of them worldwide. Um, and they swim in every ocean. I mean, there used to be vast numbers of them off Africa and down off South America and through the 60s and 70s with all the netting and the irresponsible, you know, commercial harvesting that went on, those fish got decimated um, from their historical numbers, not only in the Atlantic, but, you know, as you've seen in the Pacific. Um, and then I'm not sure if it's related to fisheries management. Truthfully, I think there's another thing that we might get to about why I think those bluefin have, have come back and, and what led to it here anyway in the North Atlantic. Um, I have a pretty interesting hypothesis. So we'll get to that. But um, the, the fish up here, they, they range from that small size to the, to the huge size. And over the last, say, 15 years is the first time in a long time where those fish swim in the same waters. Nice. Gotcha. Oh, we've, we've interviewed a fair amount of guys from, up from up from Cape Cod and that area. Yeah, and yeah I, I saw a couple of your recent ones. Do you, uh, you say you tar target on typically light tackle? That's or all I do is on light tackle. I, okay. I mean, I started, you know, there, you there were a few guys the, doing it before. Do you go after the big ones on light tackle or do you, you try to yeah, go? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Ab yeah. Ab absolutely. I've, you know, since the, the, the fishery became such where not only the, these fish were accessible, um, but the gear was capable. And, you know, these other guys that you've had on recently uh, from my fishery, you had the young guys uh, a couple of weeks ago, Mikey Zamito, uh, real young dude, fishy guy, um, just started in the fishery though, uh, you know, a couple of years ago. Um, I see him out on the water and he gets after it. So he, he's one of the newcomers and the new entries. And you had another uh, couple of guys that, that, that I see out on the water from time to time that started, um, you know, not quite that long ago. I'm not quite sure exactly. It varies from time to time, depending on which site you look at, <laughs> what you hear from. Yeah. Them. Um, <laughs> you know, anyway, I, I've been doing it since you know about 2003 on 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 a light gear with the small fish they were they were real accessible and we had those shimano sustains and some of the early pen slammers accessible and the fish were small and so you could go out and you could muckle it up and and, and you could hook a ton of them and i when i say a ton of them i mean you could go out there and we were throwing tins we were throwing um three ounce point jude pogies which was one of the original tins point jude lures um, with a little feather bucktail off the back end, a siwash hook. And these fish were, you know, anywhere from, say, 20 to 28 to 30 pounds at the outset. Oftentimes, they'd be around schools of larger bass. And so you'd be geared up for those bass anyway. And we got to cut our teeth for those first couple of years on, on some real small fish and, and, and tons of them. You'd have tons of shots every day. And then, like I said, in 2008, everything changed. And that same year class kept coming back. And then through 2005 and 2006, um, I noticed that they didn't clearly get all that much larger. And that's through the cycling of fish. But there was a good year class in 2004 as well. So there were good recruitment from those two years. And those fish had a proclivity to come back to our waters. Um, we have an abundance of forage for them. We have some really neat bottom uh bathymetry which naturally attracts bait fish we have upwellings of cold water we have the labrador current we have the gulf stream in close proximity and then you have nantucket shoals which is just this magical piece of extended land if you will with a lot of gaps in between it and a lot of currents in between it that extends off both sides of the islands and then that shoal finishes up right where the Labrador current ends. So you have that huge upwelling and there's a real close entry from the submarine canyons um, there. We also have the you know, unique feature of north of us. Um, we have another entry, the Great North Channel, and, and they come in a lot, oftentimes out of those eastern canyons. They'll cycle down from the north and in through our waters through, through that route. And so we actually have both routes sort of cycling and, and combining like right here in Cape Cod, which just makes it real nice. We get a long season. They show up a lot earlier than people think, and they leave way later than people think. And it's a fish that swims in five feet of water comfortably out to, you know, the depths of the canyons. And, and, and it's a fish that really 
just grabs people. I, I think it's ruined marriages, lives, um, mm -hmm. all sorts of other things. I've seen a lot of people go through a lot of stuff, um, myself included. My journey, um, you know, to those fish and, and the distances that I ended up having to travel uh, to get to them after that 2008 season um, it is just monumental. And so it's, 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 it's quite a hurdle to, to try to target a fish like that. Um, but to consistently do it and to have success, especially on the light gear, um, I, I, I just chose to focus on them. All of the species went to the side. Uh, 2004, I, I, I just stopped. That was it. I did my last squid trips, I think, in 2005 or 2006 until I got my second boats. Um, and just I've dedicated every season since then. So it's been about 18 years of just nothing but bluefin for me. Do you ever so put the blue, blue fins on the back burners? Do you ever see those white marlins out there and off of Nantucket Shoals? Because they oh god, yeah, all the time, all like, the time. We've had tons you, of shots. I've I've had. I'm sorry, go ahead. I just I hear fucking folklore about these these cold water no, marlins that live in 60, 60 feet that I know nothing about, but I want to know. fucking that. come in right on that. Listen, you're from Ocean City, Maryland, and so you get them down there, and that's like the focal point. We get them up here in this spot that just not a lot of people transit. Number one, the gray lady lives there. It's that fucking fog. It is brutal. It comes and it goes, and it shows up and it leaves, and you got really strong currents, and so you got to leave out of one or two areas. You got Muskegon Channel, which is famous for huge stacked up, you know, you got a, a narrow gap and, and a ton of water coming out of Nantucket Sound or entering Nantucket Sound. You typically have those bitchy Southwest, you know, afternoon winds you got to contend with. A lot of times it's fucking coming off the Northwest after a dying Northwest. And those white fucking Marlin, six, seven miles out sometimes. And there's just nobody down there transiting in that area. And they hang in the green water of all fucking places. This is this is what it blows, blows my mind. I spent all my all my life living looking in the for blue water. Places. You gotta be in the and, green water. And you guys are in no, deep. they're in the green. They're 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 always right on that edge. And where you encounter them predominantly most is on the green side, and it's always on the weed edges. And you'll see that you know a lot of my clients will look over and they'll be like that. There's a lobster pot right there, and instantly I know exactly what they're seeing. And you get that dorsal that's up and of course the caudal in the back and so they see the two sticks one a yeah, little yeah. bit higher than the other there and it's always uh -huh. just inside the weed line and they're bitchy up there though uh there's a couple of good ways to hook them on live bait um i've been successful a few times with the fly guys and i've had real success with the eels you pitch them the eels and um and, and it does magic and then the little baby scup as you guys would call them porgies up here the, or the scups you cut the top fin off those um we used to use the real small ones but now you gotta watch out they gotta be 10 inches or so but that's like marlin candy if you can find them there and and there's guys that fish off nantucket that have that ability to get out the back side they can cut through tucker nook and they can get out the back side and there's quite a few of them out there that just keep their mouths shut and these guys go out and do work uh, you know catch 10 11 uh, a session from a little 20 foot boat um, and a lot of them are big. A lot of them are really big. Like, you know, what white Marlin, you know, tournament winners, you know, I, I've seen yeah. quite a few guys that claim to have them as big. And I've seen quite a few pictures of some guys holding some fish that, you know, are, are, are true, you know, 70 to 90 pound specimens. There's no doubting it based on the length. A lot of them don't pull them out of the water. And I think they're bigger up here because it's the Northern, you know, I feel like midst of their, uh, Range. I've caught them. I've caught them as low as sixty-four degrees, and I feel like typically they're sixty-four, sixty-five degrees. That's our green water. I got you. I feel like they're... yeah, that's that's typically our green water. Sixty-two to sixty-four degrees or so is right on that edge for the inside water, and it's right around the twenty fathom line. And so you'll get that blue water that'll come in off the canyons, and sometimes but it'll like, be true canyon water with that that got that good blue. Like I'm, I'm just joking, but like right there, right. So when I get there, right, <laughs> right, right on that twenty fathom curve. Yeah, he's on he his way, dude. Here, he's fire dude. up the engines. Well, here's the funny thing: a lot of these fucking clowns with these shows, you know, it's one of those things where they told me this like podcast was gonna be like whatever. Like a lot of these fucking guys with these shows, they take their boats and they drive up the fucking coast, but they always hire a local guy, right, who gets a little like byline at the bottom of the thing. 
yeah. and you got the guy up there that's you know promoting his shit you could do that though that's one of those fisheries if you had some experience on the way marlin and you wanted to come up um the bluefin's a tough thing it, they, they move whereas those white marlins it's with the water and so if you fish them and you fish them in the shallower depths you guys can come up here and trailer a boat or, or just find somebody with a boat there's plenty of guys out here that would you know bitch themselves out and take you out and probably pay you to do it <laughs> um but you could come up and, good, and you could do work good front runner expedition nick why um, not you know why not um, do it so just i'll only bother you about the white marlins a little longer but um <laughs> no keep it up i love the funny thing is is it's one of those species that everybody you know on the planet basically gets hot for and and they're a tough species when we see them Nine times out of 10, my guys spook them. They throw a bad cast. You know, if you can get that eel out in front of them. And then a lot of times we, we jump them off. You got to use yeah. real light leader up here, like 15, 20 pound test. Um, you know, we what, use uh, typically the circle. You got you to gotta use the circle hooks now with the, with the live bait. And so it's made it ultimately a lot harder. What, um, what, when does that typically, when do you start to see the white marlins? Every year is different. You know, some years like 2015, 2016, we had this big finger of canyon water that pushed in out of the dip, um, which is just to the east of Hudson Canyon between Block Canyon and Hudson. And it came in and it stayed attached and it, it just kept pushing north and kept pushing north and kept pushing north. And it came across some pretty common grounds to see yellowfin and say like late July or early August, when you get that predominantly warmer water everywhere, the inside water is warm, the outside water is warm. You got blended water at best. Um, most of the canyon guys are running vast distances to try to find a change at that yeah. point. And, and we'll, we'll see them then, but on those rare years, 2015 and 2016 was one of them. We were catching yellowfin in 90 feet of water um, between Martha's Vineyard and No Man's Land, which is this tiny little island right off of it and that year um the wahoo pushed in and the whites came in and it was june i mean it was the last wow. week of june so do you so need like you a, never know do you need like a piece of warm water for those things to ride in on typically yeah, absolutely what? absolutely the, the, when, when they show up the most is when we have a ton of the sorry around when the half beaks come mm -hmm. in and they come in thick and you see those half beaks come in and you see the turtles and you see a lot of that sargassum, you know, that, that, that obvious canyon um, debris that comes in. And we get those fingers and they push in off the 40, come in on the 30. And a lot of times they ride that ridge with the southerlies. So we'll get a Bermuda high. That's usually when we see those white marlin come in is when we get one of them Bermuda highs. We've had a couple seasons where you get just Bermuda high after Bermuda high after Bermuda high. And so it's southwest, 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 southwest every day blowing stink you know 25 to 30 knots and that just pushes everything we see cobia we see tarpon we see sailfish white they had a white marlin in the um on the north side of the cape uh, off provincetown we see mahi mahi from time to time it's rare but it's always to do with that blue water getting pushed in you know those fingers of blue water <laughs> like it lot, yeah. it typically is like a, a southwest wind year like a lot yeah, of Southwest. Yeah, when we get those heavy Southwest, you know, if you see a couple of Bermuda highs early on um, and you get predominantly a Southwest wind, those whites will show up as early as late June, early July. They're always here every year. Um, you know, a lot of the guys in the tri-state tournament, I don't do tournaments. I, there's enough competition in the water and I got trouble getting out of my own way most days. So getting out of the way of like 70 or 80 other boats you know, trying to fish for the same thing. I just decided a long time ago, keep your head down, you know, book your charter, don't pay any attention. Um, but those tournaments, there's there, there's an awful lot of guys that'll complete their bag and, and be able to do quite well out of a port, you know, right here in New England, whether it be off Martha's Vineyard or even from the mainland. And they're able to go out and they're able to get the sword, the yellowfin, the big eye, the bluefin and the white, uh, wow. sometimes several white. It's, it's all dependent on mother nature. You know, every year is different. I, I try to tell everybody, you know, that the, the canyon water and where these fish recede to, they all basically go back out there in the middle and hang around. And then when the light gets right and then, and, and they feel the scent and, you know, stuff starts going on on the inside, they all start to filter in. I mean, truthfully, if you talk to some of the old timers, swordfish was an inshore species back in the day, you know, especially up here in New England. They'd get him on the 20 fathom line on a regular basis. And it would be they, typically from, uh, you know, a harpoon. Yeah, they, I was about to say they used to harpoon them. They used to like see them mixed in with the bluefins. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I've jumped a few, um, you know, east of the Cape. I've actually had two. Um, I had a client that I, I, I knew what it was as we approached it after seeing the first one and just kind of being, you know, boondoggled by it. It just didn't equate. It looked like a shark, but it didn't. And then I, I looked at it and right as my guy cast, I was like, Marlin, like what? Didn't quite register. And then this big old peduncle came out of the water and, and, and you know, shot off and it was brown. And half the boat insisted it was a thresher because of the color. And I knew right away it was a swordfish tail. And there's a few harpoon boats that have stuck them, you know, in the Bay of Maine and right here off the Cape. And, and, and so they, they come out. We got some really deep water close to shore. I can get to 900 feet in less than 25 miles or so. So, Gotcha. Just fascinating that, you know, from Cape Hatteras north, like you got to run pretty far to see some stuff like that. I mean, the blue fins can be north, but like, you know, even in Cape Hat out of Oregon Inlet, you got to go run and find the blue water. But up there, you guys just have the bait and it's just wild. The, the, the bait. Kind of, it's all yeah. about the bait. Yeah. And they're truthfully a fish that, you know, just swims in shore. We see them in, in really shallow depths. And over the last couple of years with the, the drones and the guys catching footage, especially down off New York with the return of the Menhaden. and you know, they stopped the Omega three boats with the reduction on the, on the Menhaden. And we've seen this super resurgence of bunker or, or pogies as we call them up here, whatever your flavor is, it is it's those men hate and it's like snacks. I mean, the whales show up on them, the dolphin come in on them and they come real close to shore. Cause that's where those men hate and like to, you know, they, they, that's where they come out of. That's where they predominantly hang is off the beaches. So you're getting guys down off long Island that are capturing drone footage of, you know, seven, 800, 900 pound fish, you, you know, crashing. And now you're seeing, you know, lots of footage of guys from shore actually casting from shore for striped bass. And you got, you know, another hundred yards and you got a 400 pounder just launching out of nowhere. It's wow. Incredible. Yeah. It's, it's been, it's been nuts the last five, six years, especially it, uh, it really has boomed 2008 through 2012 was pretty magnificent, but then there was a, a def wall that was hit where it's just like sort of just got hard it got a lot harder to find them and catch them what's up guys this is leo here sorry to interrupt the podcast but i wanted to take a brief second to invite you guys to come visit us at the miami international boat show we'll be there february 15th until the 18th so from wednesday to sunday besides that we're also going to do a really really cool live in-person podcast recording event The location is quite small. It's in downtown Miami. So unfortunately, we can't invite everyone to the the podcast. However, we'll be inviting a select few people through email. These these will be fans of ours, friends of ours. So if you really would like to join, shoot us a message on Instagram. Shoot us an email. You can email me or the team at team at billfish.site. Let us know you want to come by and we'll make sure to send you an invite. Again, it will be in downtown Miami on February 15th. It will be invite only just because the location is very small. So you have to limit the amount of people that we, that we invite. But if you really want to come and you're sure you can attend, please let us know. We're going to be doing a live product release. We're going to do video premieres and a bunch of other cool stuff at that event. So again, Bill Fish X Hook Optics live podcast event, February 15th in downtown Miami. See you guys there. What do you do when you're not fishing or what are you doing in the off season? Um, I used to go to Mexico every year at a place down there during COVID living in a foreign country and being that far away is like 5,000 miles from my house and uh-huh. just wasn't the right place to go and hang anymore. Um, gotcha. and so where in Mexico? In Florida now. Uh, I was down on the Belize border you know, on okay. the Caribbean side, just like Ascension uh, Bay, Amber, uh, just south of Ascension Bay. Actually, I was gotcha. about to say you got, so you got a spirit to Santu just to the North and then you got the Bay of Tetumal. Ambergris K. I was right on the line there. Ambergris K was about oh, 45 minutes by boat just south of me. So I had the turn F's uh, just to the south that we could hit. And then uh, Chinchoro Bank, which was about 17 miles off to the east of me. And I spent I don't know, 10, 15 years down there plying not only the lagoons, but doing some offshore runs with some of the local guys, um, hand lining. And uh, if there was any kind of gas or fuel or, or marina or sort of like anything that you could get to there there's an area on the planet that if anybody's watching and you got big box i know the waters and look me up and bring your big badass boat out there park it right off that it's called chinchoro bank and it's out in international waters mexico owns the area around the banks but there's three seamounts off the back side of it and 
I kind of had this notion when I went down there that maybe I could get out there, but the, the hurdles to just get basic groceries in that area where I was at six miles South of Cancun, um, by car. So you have to fly into Cancun airport stay in like Tulum the first night. And then the second day drive down and, uh, that drive, once you hit South of Tulum was like a little bit, uh, rural, I guess would be the most politically correct thing, but it was just too far. Uh, my house was was off grid. It was uh, solar powered with a diesel generator backup and a gas generator backup and rainwater collected in cisterns and then brought to the roof with a DC um, gravity fed to get purified water in. It was cool. I mean, it, had, it just had too many challenges. Um, you know, we ran it as a small little uh, like B and B, I guess you could call it. Had your own kitchen space, predominantly to the fly fishermen. Real good bone fishing down there, tarpon. Um, and the Arrecife uh, is is the, the Americas is like the second longest barrier reef on the planet, and we were fortunate enough to be right there on it, and only about uh, you know half a mile from the reef itself. So really good kettle bottom fishing on the inside you know coral heads um really good backwater lagoon fishing and when the winds would stop blowing if, if i could have figured out a way to get down there in the summertime um you know unfortunately their marlin and tuna season is sort of reciprocal to ours up north um yeah. those fish come around the, the corner there from from the equatorial range basically and filter through and they do their marlin tournament in like the middle of july and it's like, you know, 95 degrees and 100% humidity. You think it's hot, like in the southern states, it's down on the, it's just about the 18th parallel down there. And so yeah. that's what I was doing. And now I'm in Florida. I grabbed a place in Florida All right. last year. So I'm in the middle of a, I'm, in, I'm over near Cedar Key. Uh, I'm right on the Swanee River here. Just decided Florida had the best politics and lots of open space. And my dollar went pretty far. It's like the Hunger Games up north. Um, <laughs> with people buying and selling stuff. So uh, it's just me and my wife didn't have any kids. And uh, because we were doing the travel and I got rid of that place uh, down there, it, it just made sense to find somewhere that was a little bit warm and the climate was a little more friendly. So it's pretty Wait, so cool. Where, here. Lots of good hog that? hunting. Uh, I'm right on the Swanee. It's Cedar Key, which is, um, you know, if it's north of Tampa, like two hours, Crystal River is probably got the it, most got famous it. spot. Yeah. Um, Isn't that what, I, the, I where the, the, the guys used to do the the tarpon fishing for the giant giant tarpons, or is that for the north? Oh, there's I mean there's like redfish, there's tarpon during the mullet run. That's south predominantly this time of year. That the, the tarpon don't come up here until a little bit later when it gets warm. Gotcha. Um, but it's the redfish up here. Everybody comes here in the winter for the for the redfish. How far um, are you from like Steenachie? I'm um, only about twenty minutes from Steenachie. Yeah, nice. I heard the red fishing there yeah. is out of control. That's yeah, pretty well. A good town, fun town. Yeah, no, from there, from Steenhatchee. And, you know, the beauty of it is once you get to the west of the Sun Coast, uh, which is 19 that comes down the Sun Coast, it's pretty remote. And so it, it's still old world Florida. Um, and it's far enough away from the crowds and the masses. And I get to shoot guns every day and go pig hunting. And nice. You know, it's, it's pretty cool. Fat ass. Pretty cool spot. Yeah, my uh I gotta dial in the fishery now though. I haven't gone to the boat yet. I just cleared uh almost two and a half acres of, of lumber. Uh, so we had to do the lumber project and now it's cleared. And yeah, the wife's got ideas to uh to get herself a little barn and a donkey and a horse and there you go. I've at it. So it's more like work. More like work right now. Yeah. <laughs> happy wife's a happy life. That's right. Are you guys watching. That's that's basically it. And that's right. Happy. Well, and we can keep fishing. Right. Right. Pretty cool, man. That's uh and then so you go back and forth for the for the I assume from still up to the north or yeah, I finally figured it out. Uh you know, I was doing the, the I had a house up in Rhode Island and I was out on the Cape. So sort of like part of the morphing into the bluefin thing came with um what I used to call hotel Chevy. And it started with a barn door suburban big 2500 ck um and i was so far from home that i ended up spending four or five six nights and rather than get a hotel and cut into the charter you know i'd, I'd go to there's a ton of campgrounds out there I, I actually got real good at going to the hotels 
and getting key cards for my clients because I'd be using a ramp in a certain town. And so I'd have them stay and I grabbed the key card. It would just still get you in the outer door. It wouldn't get you in, in the rooms, but it'd get you a hot shower. And a lot of times I'd, you know, go in and fill up my black plastic bags, ice out of all the ice machines on each floor. <laughs> so I'd grab free ice. And it was a pretty cool way to be a, a kind of a nomad. It got a little taxing on the home life, but for about six, seven years, that was basically the way I did it running out of Rhode Island. Um, unfortunately, they were only there for a short time in the, in the spring and then they'd come back in the late summer to but stay on them consistently. I basically had to turn, you know, the truck into the land yacht first. And so my motto was get as close to them on land as possible possible so that you can maximize your fishing time yeah. and that was just utilizing the different ramps throughout the cape and using it not only for 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 a springboard to get to the fish closer but to weather you know having that ability to get out of those winds and because those fish love to sit near shore um, a lot of times you can make a day out of it when you would have had to normally cancel unless you're in a huge boat yeah that's kind of wild the geography there like you can almost if you're mobile, you can almost fish any. Almost you have every, to be mobile. Unless it, Truthfully, unless it's like you a. You gotta be mobile. Yeah, I guess it. You I really guess, do. I mean, if, especially if you want to call yourself a bluefin hunter. Now, let's look at the the progression of the fishery. Um, there's an awful lot of guys that come from north uh, down to the south and in the, in the, for the winter fishery and vice versa, but that's a fish that's accessible basically year round now. Um, since they've come back and with the advent of the internet, the wonderful ability to, you know, see where they're going real time because nobody can keep their mouth shut and everybody loves their Instagram, Instagram. you know, bang, bang, bang. So it's, it's, it's there. It's, it's immediately accessible. It's, 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 you got chat groups, you got guys that have met one another that would have never met one another. You've got the modern electronics thrown in and you've got a species that's had a real burgeoning uh, in numbers. And so it's this just, awesome fishery that anybody really now can take part in it's um it's 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 got to the point now where you can access it from a kayak there's a guy in jet jet ski down in north carolina that's pretty famous that goes out you know 30 40 miles to the edge there in winter and gets it done on a jet ski there's guys fishing for them out of kayaks canoes pontoon boats um it's a tribute to the to the draconian measures that the western fishery you know face for so long, while the rest of the world fished at 47 inches, you know, Canada and the United States uh, self-regulated at 73. And so we're seeing yeah. the benefits of that, um, you, along with another benefit. There's, there's one other benefit that came to play for those fish, which we can get into when you want to talk about bluefin and the stocks. But no, oh, well, I was about that. I was going to talk about me all night. I was about to ask, do you ever worry <laughs> about do you ever worry about it? it not being sustainable with that, that level of pressure? Or do you think it's no, no, thankfully they've proven that despite them being the most highly pursued fish on the planet, the fecundity of this animal is quite insane too. I mean, they're, they're, they're able to give birth to, to large amounts of young that survive. And typically with most species, as they get a little bit older and, and, and able to handle the environmental issues that will encounter over through the course of their biology, um, Typically, the bigger you get, the, the less worry you have from predation. Well, that doesn't exist with some certain high-level predators, and bluefin being the number one. Thankfully, these things swim all over the place, and they give birth to lots of babies, and there's really not much you can do to them with a rod and reel. And even with the nets and the vast commercial, you know, fishers that they had, these fish are able to swim in areas where it's just not sustainable for humans to go. They, they, they travel across the oceans. Um, they travel back and forth on a regular basis. Um, this is a fish that, you know, for many years, this supposed expert, Barbara Block, out on the West Coast, and this guy, Carl Safina, told everybody was endangered, and, you know, the bluefin are going to be extinct in 15 years, and, you know, it was on the front of that stupid Wicked Tuna show. Um, no offense to the guys I love that are on that show, like, I mean, they're great fishermen and all, but that show has done an awful lot of damage <laughs> um, to the recent uh, you know, resurgence of the fish. It's certainly given an awful lot of people the, you know, tequila balls to just come out and fucking go after these fucking things without a clue we'll get to that another point in this conversation but um the fish have come back on in, in such a level that it, it, it's just i don't worry about it i don't worry about them they're super hardy i've tagged a bunch of fish 
Um, I've had clients mishandle fish. I've watched plenty of other people mishandle fish. I mean, there's guys that call themselves professionals that mishandle them on a regular fucking basis, dropping them up in the lap, you know, posing them with four different outfits on with five different guys, typically dropping another lure into the thing's mouth, you know, flavor of the month. This is what caught it. Let me change my hat. Wait a minute, change the background. You know, because when you only get out five or six times, you need an awful lot of footage. And that's the cycle that you do. You hold it out, the, the long arm. It's, it's you gotta predominant. Get, they gotta get their content, you know? It's predominant. Yeah, you, know, you got to get your content. You got to get your chest beaten in. It's part of, truthfully, the, 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 the love-hate relationship I have with the industry I'm in. It's, it, it certainly has changed. Um, anybody that's been involved in it for more than half a second. And, and I say that red hot minute, say more than say five years or 10 years. Um, when you go back all the way and, you, and, you, and, you, and if you've, you know, really truly become a fisherman, you should have done your research on whatever species you're going after. Not only it's ethology, it's life cycles, where it lives, what it does, how it gives birth, where it eats. Um, it's different cycles of life. The, the, all, the list goes on and on. You should have at least looked at the history of, of, of targeting that fish and whether it be a sport fish or a fish that's been fished commercially. Um, I think that's the basic problem in, in, in the fisheries today is that, um, you know, this need for, for the content, as you said, it has sort of made the fish secondary. A lot of these guys, I don't even think like the fucking fish. They just... <laughs> They were never good at anything when they were little. They do it for the fame. Um, you know, and then they get to be older. So they got either golf or they got fishing. <laughs> Depends gotcha. on whether you like the water or green grass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I see your, your, I think your most badass catch on your boat is not a bluefin tuna. It's a mola mola. Oh, that mo oh, you got that mola mola picture. That's one of the coolest fish. I, that's definitely one of the coolest things I've that's ever That's badass. Done. We had been talking about it for years um and and that fish was actually hooked on a spin rod and a plug and holy shit when i tell piled you, on it barn door, it just it didn't really pile on it as much as just swam into it now a lot of people say that those <laughs> things don't eat lures i know they eat mackerel i know they eat squid because i've hooked them on bait rods before but this thing swam in and it was hooked in the mouth when it came up to the boat <laughs> whether he snagged it in the mouth or that thing ate it i'll never fucking know but two and a half hours after he hooked it, he got it up to the boat, and then it was so tired, I was able to grab that thing. And what a paint job that thing had on it. That's beautiful. Really I'm looking at it. it. That's sick. It's literally one of my most – it's probably I'm, – I'm probably more proud of that thing than all the fucking giants on Lake Gear. I've ever <laughs> Dude, that thing is sick amazing. looking. <laughs> did it jump? Did it jump when it hooked? When it was hooked or not? It jumped twice. Like yeah, despite what people think, a lot of times – will come rolling on scene um, where bluefin hang. Now, when you see those molas, you know you're in the right area. They typically, blue sharks, molas, bluefin. Um, and those mola jump. They free jump all the time. Yeah, this yeah. one, about 30 seconds in, came rocking and out of the water. And instantly, I see this big black and white. And it was black and white. And at first, like, I was like, black and white? What the? And when it hit, it kind of like flapped that upper wing and i knew instantly and i looked right at him and i was like oh you're fucked now yeah <laughs> but uh -huh. he did i mean he, he he did he did he did the damage he did what he needed to do he had a big stella on it he let the drag and it was in deep water so the thing sounded twice and then it was just a matter <laughs> of him grunting and bringing it up wow what's their skin like i, I plowed one on the way home i had the winning white marlin for the mid-atlantic <laughs> in, in in the boat and we were only 50 48 miles from home so i was like oh i'm gonna take it easy and uh i was doing like their bone with like shark skin like yeah. it's rough i had the guy I, I actually grabbed it without a glove and changed my mind instantly so i put on two gloves and, and grabbed it by the wings and when he finally went to go the the, you know the noise as he let go it, it's enough to let you know what you do to, if you ever wanted to hug one <laughs> not advisable they got barnacles they a lot yeah, of them yeah. got prop wounds this guy was clean he was like the king kamehameha of mola molas i should have fucking harvested them is what i should have done because I, as far as i can tell there's no limit and there's no there's no law that says i couldn't know so yeah. i don't know it would have been pretty cool i know there's been a couple of guys that have done it they eat them over in south korea that one would have been the one but I don't know. That was Maybe I've never like seen them like shoot, white like shoot, that too. It's pretty cool. I've seen I've seen them white up here. It was pretty badass. It was definitely a pretty badass fish. Cool experience. 
That's sick. I plowed that. I plowed one of those things, dude. Yeah, they're not fun. Yeah, they'll wreck a lower unit, the bigger ones. They suck. I was like, I can't. You guys are out there just minding their own business, and you guys are running them over. Well, yeah, there's tons of them, too. When that water gets in, we get that cold water up against, you know, that medium (laughs) warm water with the mix. And because of that Labrador current, we get some 45 to 50 degree water up against 65 to 68 degree water a lot of days. And those things hang right on that edge. You'll see turtles, leatherbacks. Um, we get a lot of them around. We get those big jellies, those big ocean they got a, jellies. A lot of the water we fish in. I feel like they got a sim- similar lifestyle as a as a as a turtle. Just kind of lay out there. Yeah. Until they- yeah. I don't, know. I don't know if you've ever seen it. There's a, there's a really funny thing about a mola. This guy does this complete diatribe about. Oh, I saw that on the life. internet. I, it's it's got to be 10 he years old. He fucking hates it. It's yeah. the fucking worst fucking fish on the fucking planet. And he goes through like, it's, it's, it's great. It's I got to find that thing. That's hilarious. Check it out. If you ever want a little bit of a good read, and it's a really fun read. Yeah. The art of the, you know, the pen is dead unfortunately now like you know still pictures used to be cool now like you got to put your still pictures to video to get anybody to view it on this instagram yeah. it's everything's like split bang 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 it's sort of like the careers of a lot of the guys in charter fishing <laughs> cool man that's uh quite the education dom definitely uh i definitely want to see them white marlins up in that up in that water one day up in that shallow yeah, water. Yeah, if you want to come on up and get you into a white marlin and a giant bluefin on a, on, a, on a toothpick, if you want to. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah, nowhere awesome. else on the planet, truthfully, that 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 you can do what what I'm able to do uh, on these fish. Number one, we can harvest them. The only other places on the planet that you can do it, you got off Tenerife, the Canary Islands, you got uh, Gibraltar, you got a few other spots where these giants are known to roam. Italy, um, they're illegal to harvest. So other than Croatia and Serbia. Um, none of these guys can take these fish. And wow. so, you know, uh, the, the whole thing goes, you catch a big fish, you release. So there's been some releases of some big fish, but nowhere are you able to document that other than Canada or the United States. And so it's where you can actually book a charter, get on board, harvest a giant. So that actually comes back and gets verified. You know, you've yeah. been. Some guys just killed, a, killed like a 550 in South Florida here last week on the sword grounds right right now those guys are going to start seeing a lot more of those as they start coming back down around in the thing but with the deep dropping going on you're probably going to see a few more the 550 a couple of weeks ago a two maybe last year or the year before i think they had like a 855 there was another one on one of those center consoles those poor guys fought it for like 15 hours and then did the right thing I don't yeah it was a couple of years one. ago right yeah yeah, they called it in and they made him cut it away. And I mean, they fought that thing for about 12 hours on like, I think it was like 30 pound test. They're fishing for, for, for something small and stupid. And they hooked that thing and did the deed and, and brought it up dead. It, you know, and many big fish do when you fight them for that long, it, it died on the line. And of course, the government and its infinite wisdom made those poor bastards cut that fucking thing away. Nick, I might have chosen that to be my political statement, hung it, brought it back, and just, you know, sort of like that old thing, just ask for forgiveness instead of permission. Yeah. Nick, do they, do they probably wasn't you, worth it? No, not worth it. Have you oh, heard yeah. him in, in Cat K, Nick, at all lately? Not recently. I got you. No, they haven't been down. It's been a couple of years. Bimini gets that run every now and then, but it seems like the Florida Straits um, has had quite the few. I don't know if it's a, a sign that probably that golf's cleaned up a little bit after that deep horizon spill, but they had a couple of good years, like right before the horizon spill of the, of the golf, um, you know, births where the, the, the recruitment came from. And then despite what a lot of people think, those fish aren't going to swim back into a polluted body of water. And so I think that's why you've seen a hiatus of, of some of those bigger fish, but the guys from Louisiana over the last few years, there's been a, quite a few big fish and there's been quite a few episodes where those guys are out on the lumps in February, you know, t- tossing to the, to the big yellow fin and then the big fin, come, they, they come and crash the party, those big blue fin. Uh, been a couple of spear fishing videos lately of, of people down here in Florida. Uh, there's a big blue fin that came through. Yeah, I saw that. Were, were, were out in front of a cage. Yeah. It's, those things swim wherever the fuck they want. That, that's the point. Uh, when you're that big and you're that bad, you can swim wherever you want. 
Well, cool, man. That was, like I said, an education, dude. Super, super interesting. I appreciate it. I'm looking at a picture of your yeah. dusky uh, covered in squid ink. Oh, yeah. No, those are the old days. I like That's that. going back quite a bit. I, yeah, I had two boats running. I actually, um, you know, I, 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 I was a, fortunate enough to be able to be busy enough where I was able to bring two different guys in. Um, I've had two different captains who um, were with me to start and then have gone off onto their own and have become quite successful um, in their own ventures. So it's kind of cool as, uh, you know, I learned everything from, from, from other people. Um, it, it, it was kind of cool for me to have the ability to have two boats running. But uh, uh, as I got a little bit older, I, I realized I really just don't work well with people. Do you have a mate now or no? No, I've never run with a mate. I've never, ever run with a mate on the boat. Um, I've always done it solo. I run out of a center console. That's to get my crews immersed. I've let a few of my clients grease fish, um, you know, big fish with the harpoon or the gaff. Um, uh, I right. kind of view it as it's better to let them get on the boat and, 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 and sort of be privy to every aspect of it, including, you know, spotting them and hunting them and then hooking them. It's not one of those experiences where you're handed a rod or everything's set up and it's structured. A lot of guys bring their own gear um, on my boats. It's a super clean fishery, which is kind of why I chose it. I fish with all artificials. And so it's all metal mm -hmm. And, 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 and acrylics Easy. and plastics. And I used to use some wood plugs, but I, I don't get bait. I, I leave, I, I, you know, straight to the grounds and I'm focused on one thing. And sometimes I go home fishless, but uh, more often than not, I'm able to put the boat over them. And I've landed some fucking huge fish on, on spin gear and, and conventional overheads um, with really light line. I mean, there's just Nobody else on the planet's even come close, truthfully. I can say that, look straight in the fucking camera. There's not a person on earth that would argue with me. I put more huge fish on my deck on these spinning rods than anyone. I've had a fish over 700, two fish over 600, three fish over 500, and numerous from 300 plus with all the landing slips to go with it. It's not one of those things where I can like, say oh i've done this and i've done that I, I you know i used to live my life on instagram but i got a documented photographic history of all these things it's the only place you can do it and there's a bunch of guys that'll be squirming in their seats when i say this but they've been charter captains up here for a long time and they haven't gotten it done on a single one so there's guys that'll probably get one you know lucky there's been a few big fish landed by a random captain here or there there was an incredible catch last year by a guy actually that's been on my boat they hooked one of those big ones on a, on, a, on a little jig stick trying to make bait and they were able to subdue it. And there was another kid, younger guy down in the lower Cape Cod Bay in the bass grounds that hooked one on a bass rod and they were able to follow it around long enough and got some assistance from another boat. So it's doable, but repeatable is what, you know, I'm after. And that's, you know, what I've laid my hat on. I, I chose to go after yeah. these fish. I fight them on light gear and I put them on the deck. Um, each and every year, I, I'm one of the few guys, honestly, I could, you know, tell you, I can pretty much guarantee you if you show up at the right time of year, I'll get you tight to one, whether or not you land one's a whole nother story. Um, I actually had the on the water guys, they've been, you know, hitting me up for, for years and I kind of shunned it. I used to be a loud mouth when I started, um, just to get myself known. Yeah. You, know, you have to go out there and you got to advertise. And so you got to, you know, put yourself out there. And back in the day, it was chat forums. It was, you know, the fishing sites, Facebook was just starting. I'm, I'm talking back in like 2004, five, six, um, before the Facebook and before Instagram and before all that instant stuff and before the ability to go on YouTube and learn how to do everything overnight. And so I used to put all that out there. And then over the last, say, like seven, eight years or so, I've sort of shunned that because it doesn't get you anywhere. The more you kind of talk and the more you say things, the more shots you get taken at you and the more people you get following around on the water uh, more than anything. That fishery, I mean, you can launch from a car topper. And, you know, now everybody's got a boat and, 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 and everybody's got a, a friend who's got a boat. And so it, it, it's tough. It's a, it's a really difficult arena to be involved in because, um, you know, fishing on, on the whole, you've got people, you know, coming from all walks of life to enjoy a fishery. And, and bluefin is one of those special fisheries. It's sort of like if you're a hunter, like it'd be like sort of like going after elk. You know, you can go after turkey or you can go after whitetail in your own backyard. But if you want to go after elk or caribou or if you want to hunt like an African lion or something, you're going to have to go and you're going to have to pay someone. 
And um, unfortunately up here in New England, uh, the further we get into this and the, the, the ability to have boats and electronics and, and, and know-how, um, you know, it's harder to get people to pay you to go out. And, and that's something that thankfully I'm able to, to sort of distance myself from. And if you want to do it successfully with a modicum of success, even um, not only to find one, but then to hook one and then put it in the boat. So it's pretty cool. That show from on the water should be coming out soon. Um, and it's the first time I've done one, but we took two giants on, on hundred pound test um, and little jig sticks with tiny little overhead reels. The first one was probably three, 350, And the second one was over 600 or so got them both right to the boat. Um, so that should be coming out. And it's, you know, something I pride myself on. Um, there's been an awful lot of people that, you know, talk about light tackle fishing and, and, and they just don't dedicate themselves to it. They, they troll, they put out a live bait and um, in order to be successful at something, any of the guys down here in the Everglades or anywhere else on earth where they fly fish will tell you, if you want to be a fly guide, you, you can't be pulling out the live bait and a, and, a, and a spinning rod to try to put a couple permit in the boat or throwing a live crab down on the bottom. If you want to don't be putting out the live bait. Man. Yeah. Watch that live bait. <laughs> no live bait needed. That new company with that no live bait needed, I'll give them a plug. I don't know who the fuck they are, but, you know, they kind of stole my shit. That's a really good company name uh, um, because you truthfully don't. I think you can you can go anywhere on earth and you can have bucktails and you can have, um, you know, some some trolling lures and you, you can have anything other than live bait. And, and, and you can be really successful with it if you dedicate yourself to it. You I don't you think you can dedicate yourself to it. Sailfish south of Palm Beach without live bait. <laughs> mm, i don't know those fly guys not fly not guys, around those fly guys are nasty yeah not around not around the front runner boat that's for sure uh-oh tell me about that what's the front runner boat oh it's the the boat that nick runs i'd like to give him nick run now i just gave him a chance to give him a little self plug good you got to get a little quicker on the uptake there but he doesn't do that he's too humble <laughs> no nah, don't be humble not in today this is why you have a podcast i mean you have a podcast to not only talk about fisheries and and, and do it you both are obviously real enthusiastic about fishing but you don't get a chance much these days to give yourself a shameless plug so take it <laughs> nah so it's, it's your show man we're we're, we're yeah. listening to you we just we at the beginning and the end, we say, could you buy some sunglasses or some clothes? And that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, well, that's uh, that's prevalent throughout. So that's one of the fun things we talk about as some of the charter guys we talk about. Um, there's a difference between pro staff and bro staff. So I don't yeah. know you guys, I've seen the Bill Frisk group and I've seen some of your clothes and whatnot. Like, I, I don't There's this fine line you got to walk between how many horses you keep in your stable how often you run them and then how well they perform. And then the worst thing you can do and most, most of these companies have done, which is why I have very few affiliates is they put a fucking donkey in with a few stallions. The stallions <laughs> don't like it. Don't. I like yeah. it. I like the analogy. That's, that's a good analogy. <laughs> it's true. I mean, it's fucking true. You got these guys. I mean, dude, I, I up here, I mean, I'm not going to throw anyone under the bus. They can cringe on their own if they happen to watch this, which they might, because sometimes when I open my mouth, I'm known to poke a few people. But there's guys who no, literally I got that. on my boat and booked me um, over the last, say, five or six years who are now like mouthpieces and giving seminar. I mean, these seminars, let's talk about these fucking seminars, guys. As a charter captain. Your whole goal is to book people, to put people in your seats for the live show. So there's that old expression that comes back to, to just ring true. And that is those that can do those that can't fucking teach. And so there's an awful lot of this bullshit with these seminars and truthfully, all they are, no offense to the guys that run them successfully. There's a few and you're going to glean some good information on them. But for the most part, it's an opportunity for guys in areas that don't have access to their fish because it's seasonal to get together, rub elbows, tell fish stories, buy a few things from the vendors on the hall on the way in and get fucking drunk. Nothing wrong with it. I mean, I've, I've been to a few myself, but I've done one seminar. And after that one seminar, I learned quick right away. Like, what are you doing? You want to stand up and you want to talk about it, like go out and do it. And then when you can't do it anymore, then you talk about it if anybody will listen. So I think our industry has gone backwards with that. And there's an awful lot of amazing anglers out there that are representing companies, but truthfully, there's a lot more of them that are donkeys, you know, wearing 
the, the, the colors of a Kentucky Derby winner. And it's unfortunate, but I mean, there's guys with no boat, literally there's guys that don't even own a boat that are considered to be like world-class charter captains. Now you got guys on Saturday morning TV that come there every time and they tell you about this and then that, and they haul their boat all over the planet. And there's always some local dude that knows what he's doing, getting them in on the fish and he gets a little byline and, it's just, it's unfortunate, but I think most of the people that that, 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 that get after it and that want to go fish and realize right away, you got a choice. You can either do one or the other. You can't do both. Yeah. I, I mean, you got you to gotta put up or you got to shut up. And, and, and nowadays, I mean, with the ability to lie, mass lies, it's easier now. It's, it's truthfully easier now. You can create an, your own image. I mean... Let's get a little political and let's look at what happened in our fucking country here just recently. I mean, that was a mad like David fucking Copperfield with the vote. What the fuck? <laughs> you can edit that out if you want. I just figured, why not? You said speak your mind. But this is what I'm talking about. If they can hoodwink that and you can be led to believe that COVID was the next great like disease on earth that was going to fucking kill us all, you can certainly believe that I am the fucking greatest at whatever I choose to be that day. It depends on how I dress it. That's wild. Well, <laughs> that is, we've gone, what, almost two years, Nick? Almost 100 episodes and not mentioned very, very little politics. So I guess we broke that ice finally. <laughs> well, you gotta break the ice. I mean, I tried to, you know, it, it's one of those things where it pervades our society and like it's this, you know, it's cognitive dissociation with everything we do. Yeah. Um, that's the basic problem. It's a disconnection, a disassociation of human beings. Truthfully, why I gravitate towards the water, get away from land, get away from the people. If you want to feel connection, I think most of the people that go fishing to get back to it on a serious note and to stop taking shot at, you know, mankind, because it's truthfully, you know, a fishing podcast and it's about the fishery um, planet is it's all connected and everything is connected. And I think the problem we have is, is we haven't figured out how to connect completely and, and, and wholly. And, um, you know, that's sort of what I do on a daily basis is I have to bring people out there and I got to try to, like, you know, interact without intercepting or interrupting. And so, I don't know, you know, the, the, the evolution of man, like, let's go philosophical now, we went political, philosophical, <laughs> the evolution of man, you know, maybe it's the devolution, um, you know, this media society and this disconnection, like, I, you know, down in Mexico, I had no internet, and I, and I loved, like, unplugging, and I get why these people spend just mass amounts of money to go to these remote areas, and, and, and I feel the urge myself to disconnect and, and I love these people that just like sell everything and, and, and hop in a little sprinter and, and dress it up with their two dogs and off they go. Um, I mean, after, at the end of it all, like, what are we all here for? And, and if it's not here to connect, and I don't, I don't want to connect with people. So I guess the <laughs> other option is to connect with nature. So connect with fish. I like it. Right. Connect with fish. <laughs> I mean, hunting, fishing, it's that primal thing, you know, it gets beat out of you when, when, when we're kids. Every, everybody gets a beat out of them, you know, because you'd either be branded a sociopath or, or you know, sent to bad kid school. And so hunting <laughs> and fishing is a real good outlet. It's a real good way to teach you about the cycle of life and, you know, the necessitation of, of certain animals, you know, dying and, and, and becoming sustenance for other animals. Um, and the fact of the matter is, truthfully, I see like a, a, a general trend. Like it, that's what I mentioned early on is that I don't feel a lot of these people like to fish. I don't feel like a lot of these people, there's no hunters anymore. I mean, I'm down here in Florida and I'm going to some places that are just like insanely beautiful, let alone like really prolific with game. And there's just, there's nobody there. There's no licenses being issued. There's, there's not a lot of people um, willing to get out there and say, I fucking kill shit. You know, and I, and I do it. And, and the hunters and fishermen um, are the best stewards. And so it's sort of like that double-edged sword. You know, you, you got to come out there and you got to say, yeah, we're stewards of the environment and we're conservationists. But at the end of the day, we're, we're predators. And, and I see nothing wrong with, with irresponsible means of, of uh, I think it's important actually to, to, to harvest animals. And truthfully, it'd be pretty cool if like everything you wanted to eat, you had to go fucking kill first. I like it. <laughs> I you know, eat or not much. eat it. <laughs> <laughs> About to eat some fresh wahoo I right be, now. I'm eating a lot of vegetables. I don't got a very green thumb. I need to rely on a woman for that, but I'd eat a ton of protein myself. But yeah, the, the vegetables would probably elude me. 
<laughs> I see the Pilar. I see the Papa's Pilar. What are you doing back there? Yeah, yeah. You want to need a glass? I'm digging it. No, I'm, I might need a refill. Do we do breaks on this? Or? Yeah. Right. So you guys do these every 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 Tuesday, 530? Uh. Yeah, pretty now much. We do we do Monday and Tuesday and yeah, no, I checked out a couple. You had some, you've had some really, really top notch guys on there. Uh, my favorite episode that you guys did was with the Cabia. Um, he's Mark's, fucking Mark's the man. He's the man. Wow. That guy. Holy fuck! If that guy it, took it, white yeah, marlin fish, what, on, dude, that, that on film, he does so good. There's not, guy, there's, not, there's not there's not so many men walking the planet that are as fucking good as that guy on multi species, but. Yeah, you got turned on by somebody else to me that you gotta you gotta search out William Hatch, Captain Willie Hatch, okay. on the old Machaca. Machaca, gotcha. Paid like for it. with Machaca, which means in Spanish a big pile of steaming meat. But Captain yeah. William Hatch, Captain Willie Hatch is is right up there on Decabia's level in terms of. I mean, I'm a one trick pony. I do fucking bluefin and only bluefin. I'm real good at catching other things like on my own, but I'm a one trick pony. Those guys. The KB catches everything that fucking swims. Yeah, Mark's one of the best. You got to get him on that. You got to hear from Willie. Willie Hatch. Yep. If you haven't heard his name, and then that I don't guy. Know if you saw Mark today, Mark was railing sales today. The guy's hard to keep up with. You can't. You can't. You just can't keep up with. He's a cyborg. He's a legend. So. <laughs> well, thanks, Dom. We appreciate thanks, Dom. it, man. Appreciate and it. Uh, we'll uh, keep following you on Instagram for some more uh, mola mola action. Yeah, hit it up. That's Come on kidding. up and fish. Yeah, for sure, there. man. That'll be a good time. Bring your boat to the White Marlin. Bring your boat to the White Marlin. <laughs> I'll turn you guys on to where they're at. Yeah, we might do that. Cool. All right, thanks, thanks man. man. Sweet. All right, guys. Good talk. See ya.